Uh, meekness, you know, is probably one of the more misunderstood words um, in the English language. Uh, meekness does, it does not mean timidity. It's referring to uh, somebody who has control, has self-control. They have the ability and the power to, to perform something, to do something, to respond, but they choose not to respond. They have the strength and the capability and the power, but, in, but uh, they are going to defer themselves to God at work. They're going to place their faith and trust in him and say, God, I know I can try to take charge here, but I'm trusting you. So we're going to talk a little bit about meekness today. But first, I wanted to back up and uh, go ahead and read our text of Scripture. And I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 4 in verse number 23, because I wanted to back up and I like to catch that, uh, that context of, in chapter 4 and carry it on down into chapter 5 going to verse number 12. Jesus ministers to great crowds. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now what are the Beatitudes? Well, we, we just read each one of them. And they all begin with the word blessed. Uh, the word beatitude actually comes from the Latin word for blessing. So it has Latin roots when you say beatitudes. It's, the, it's these nine uh, blesseds that uh, Jesus is preaching and proclaiming. In this sermon, Jesus first describes the people of the kingdom before he actually prescribes what they should do. First off, it's who they are. Who are you? As a believer, who are you as a as a uh, citizen of the kingdom of God? And then he gets into further scripture, and as he goes into his sermon, he starts telling them what a, what a, a person like that looks like. What do they do? So first, who you are, and first, what you do. So that comes, and so we have the order here built in, and I think the order is important to understand that we are first. Uh, belonging to, to God, belonging to the kingdom of heaven, we first are uh, a citizen of that kingdom before we're actually able to perform the works that Jesus is presenting. Because it is an inward work, not only not just by sheer will, willpower, but it's work that's done by the Holy Spirit. We are able to, to do these tasks, we're able to, to fulfill uh, the Sermon on the Mount because God is working within us. This is a spiritual journey that Jesus is taking people on. The, the citizens of this area in the, in the northern part of Galilee where Jesus is ministering around Capernaum and in that area, the citizens of that country, they were, uh, they were looking for a Messiah. In fact, if you look 
uh, further up in chapter 4, it says that uh, in verse number 13, it says, And leaving Nazareth, Jesus went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's, there's a people that are dwelling in darkness. Now, the people of this area, they've not had a word from, from God, a direct spoken word from God, for more than 500 years. Malachi, the, Malachi was the last prophet to actually deliver a word, a spoken word from God to the people of Israel. So these are people that are, the Bible says they are dwelling in darkness. And all of a sudden, they see a man walking across this, walking across the landscape, preaching, teaching, healing, casting out demons. And it says they see a great light. Now, uh, when it says they dwell in darkness, darkness is just a metaphor for ignorance, lack of direction, no understanding. They lived in the, they were, they were in darkness. They could not see. They have seen a great light. It's a metaphor for knowledge, direction, and understanding. So that's what Jesus is coming for. He's to come to bring the light of the, of the gospel, the truth, to them. So they would understand that, uh, that, uh, what the rules are for coming into the kingdom. And that's where Jesus takes us in, in uh, chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. That's where Jesus begins his preaching. Now, as a culture, what are, what are we interested in? We have people here that are interested in hearing what, God, what Jesus has to say. There are crowds. There's this great crowd from this northern Galilee area, from Decapolis. So they came from the uh, eastern part of the Sea of Galilee. They came all the way around to Capernaum, which was more on the north uh, western side of the lake. They came to hear the words of life that Jesus had to give. They were interested in hearing what Jesus had to say. They wanted to understand what is this kingdom of heaven? What is this kingdom of God that he is speaking about? As a culture, where are we when it comes to understanding the kingdom of God? When it comes to, are we dwelling in, in a region of darkness? Or are we, are we uh, looking for the light, for any, any uh, bit of truth that, that, God has, that God has for us? What are we looking for? These people are interested in hearing what God has to say. They are interested in the keys of the kingdom. You know, maybe, maybe our culture is not interested enough. Maybe we have so many distractions in our culture that, that uh, the enemy has been using distractions all of our lives to try to keep us from, from uh, seeing the light, from, from seeking the light, from understanding what God has to say. I, I look at people and I wonder, God, why don't people concern themselves about their soul? Why don't they concern themselves? Why do they live as if everything is just fine and dandy and there's never going to be any problems? There's never going to be any payment to make. There's never, uh, they're going to wake up one day and make it into heaven and say, oh, here I am in heaven. How did I get here? No. No, it doesn't work that way. The Bible says that we have to come to Christ in faith, believing. It's something that, it's something that we have to, that we are participants in when, when the Holy Spirit moves upon our heart. The Bible says that he is the one that does the work. He is, the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of our sin. We don't come to Jesus any, any old time we want to. I mean, we can go out and we can preach to people out on the street and say, okay, and hand them a, hand them a card, say, okay, here's the sinner's prayer. Now you read this, now you read this. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. We have to preach the word of God to them. We have to give them the word. And as we give them the word, the Holy Spirit tugs on the heart. 
And he, and he speaks and says, yes, this is the truth. Yes, Jesus is the way. Yes, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Put your faith and your trust in him, and he will, he will deliver you from your sins. You will enter into the kingdom of God. That's the beginning. If you become poor in the spirit, and if you mourn over, over your own sins and over the sins of those around you, that's the very beginning. And the Bible says that he will hear us, and he will answer us. The Bible says that Jesus never turned anybody away that, w that was interested in the king coming into the kingdom. He listened to them, and he preached to them, and he, and he told them the truth of the gospel, and he, and he coaxed them in. But, you know, it, we have to have a desire to be there. We have to have a desire to want to hear the word of God. And I don't understand when people can go through life and have no desire whatsoever to understand, you know, where do I stand in, in uh, relation to God? Where do I stand? Now we see that the kingdom is not earthly and temporary, but as we read through there, we see that the kingdom is here now, and it's future, and it's eternal. Jesus is preaching to them about a, the kingdom of heaven. Notice that the tenses in here change. So in the very first one, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then the next six blesseds, as you go through, it says, they shall inherit, they shall be, and uh, they shall be satisfied, they shall receive mercy, for they shall, see, they shall see God. That's telling us that the kingdom of God is present here now, but also it is, uh, it's going to be there in the future. That is the kingdom that, uh, that is eternal and that uh, never fades away. And Jesus is telling them that this is the kingdom, that as uh, he preaches the Beatitudes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now many in, in Jesus' Jewish audience would have thought of Isaiah 16.1 as he's preaching this sermon. And Isaiah 61.1 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This scripture was very familiar. This scripture out of Isaiah 61 is very familiar to, these, to, these, uh, to those uh, Jewish uh, people who had been uh, indoctrinated in the Old Testament scriptures. They knew them very well. And as Jesus is preaching this, he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And uh, so they immediately go back and they think, is this the one? Is he the one that's going to actually bring about the kingdom of God? Is this the one that's spoken of by Isaiah 61? And they look at it uh, with a high interest and in trying to understand what is this kingdom of God. So they come to him and Jesus takes time out and, he's, and he preaches to them and says, and he begins with preaching that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, Pastor William Hughes of Emmanuel Baptist Church says this, there is a specific order and progression to the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek could not have come first. You couldn't say blessed are the meek first because they are not yet in the kingdom of heaven. When one is first converted, and the heart is being regenerated, and the workings of the Spirit begins in a person, it begins by producing what? A poverty of spirit. The first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first one, they realize they have nothing to give for their own salvation. This produces a knowledge of what we are before a holy God, and begins a humbling of the person. In this humbling experience, we develop a grief and a deep sorrow of our own sinfulness when we begin to mourn over our sins. So here we are, blessed are the poor in spirit. They, have, they are coming to God with no, with no payment, nothing to give.
for themselves, understanding that they are completely poor. And then when they realize that, they mourn over their sins and their, their iniquities. We come to God not with a zero sum. That would be a step up. We don't come to God with a zero sum. We come to God with a negative sum. We come with all kinds of baggage. We come carrying our own burden of sin. And the Bible says that he takes that sin and he casts it as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered again. Cast into the sea of forgetfulness. We do not come to God on a zero sum. We come to him in mourning because of, because of our spiritual poverty. So we're going to focus today on blessed are the meek. In verse 5 of chapter 5, the last uh, two times we have covered the poor in spirit and we've covered those who mourn. And today we're going to talk about blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This promise to the meek is a, also a repetition of Psalm chapter 37, verse number 11, where it says, the meek shall inherit the land. Before we discuss what meekness is, though, let's look at a few scriptures for context so that we get a, a kind of a flavor for what is meekness as, uh, as given to us by, by uh, God, by the other writers of the New Testament, by Paul. It says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. In 2 Corinthians 10, 11, the Apostle Paul, he besought one of the church, the church at Corinth, he says, he besought one of the churches by meekness and gentleness of Christ. In 1 Peter 3, 4, where the true adorning is said to be that of a meek and quiet spirit. The true adorning of a woman is of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God is of great price or great value. In relationship towards men, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, rather takes wrong and suffers itself to be defrauded. And 1 Peter 2, 19 through 22 says, And like the meek one, when reviled, it reviles not again. When it suffers, it threatens not, but commits itself to him that judgeth righteously. Speaking of Christ, that he was reviled. <clears throat> he did not revile back. He suffered, but he threatened not. He committed himself to, to his father. And we read that as you look through the book of St. John, and you start looking back through verses, chapters 12 and going all the way up through verse 17, how that he is so connected to the Father that Jesus himself is, is there to do the will of the Father. And he is communing with the Father throughout this whole time, and he's teaching, them about the, he's teaching his disciples about the Father and being connected to the Father, being connected to the vine. And Jesus is the one that he, he says, I am meek and lowly of heart. And he is the one that's teaching them and saying that we have to be of a gentle, humble spirit. Now, one who is meek is not timid. There's a, big, there's a very big difference between being meek and timid. But meekness is one of gentleness. You're gentle in their dealings with other people. Now, Many of you know my father was a pastor for many years, and uh, when he was pastoring in, in Indianapolis, uh, it, it, he always uh, wanted to meet everybody. He wanted to shake everybody's hand in the church. So he had his his way of doing that was uh, after the after the sermon after he preached, he would have somebody in the congregation, uh, one of the deacons or somebody else, say the closing prayer. He would ask them, "Okay, would you please pray?" And they would, everybody would bow their heads and they'd close in prayer. And while they're praying, my dad is going towards the back. And he's heading towards the doors. He tries to, he kept, there was multiple doors to, to exit the church. So he tried to keep those locked and everybody kind of had to go, kind of go past him so he could shake everybody's hand. Well, there was uh, one lady there. She was a visitor. It was her first time 
to visit with uh, with them at the church. And my, as always, you know, my dad being uh, very friendly, he he put his hand out and he says, "It's good to have you here." And he said, "I'm I'm so sure, so glad you came to worship with us." And she pulled her hand back. She said, "I'm not shaking your hand." He goes, "What's wrong?" She goes, "You were preaching right at me this morning, weren't you?" <laughs> well, it kind of took him aback, and of course, uh, uh, you know, he he's exercising meekness here and self-control. He said, "What now?" What I, he said, "What he, I wanted to say was, I was aiming for the devil, but you got in the way." But he didn't, he had the, uh, the, the meekness not to use such language. But he said, you know, please come, give us a chance and come back and we look forward to worshiping with you again sometime in the future. But we are to be meek. We are to be kind. We're to be gentle. And not that we don't have anything to say. It's not that we couldn't respond to somebody. But it is all because we choose not to uh, escalate the the conversation to a level that it shouldn't be taken to. One who is meek knows that God is in charge and doesn't have to defend themselves. Willing to take wrong if 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 wrong has been done, willing to accept it, but knowing that God is in charge. Now, that doesn't mean that the meek person doesn't say anything to that person, but they go around behind their back and, and, and backbiting. We don't, you know, we don't do the gossiping thing. But what, he's, what, what we're saying is that the meek person hears what is being said and holds on to it and goes to God in prayer about it, takes it to the Lord. God, you heard this, and if there's anything that needs to be dealt with, God, you deal with me but you also deal with them, and there is nothing wrong with taking that, taking any time, anything to our Heavenly Father in prayer. That's where, that's where the conversation needs to go. That's where the meek person takes the conversation, is not to the other person, not to others around them, but takes the conversation and takes it to God in prayer. Now, the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on earth, and I would agree with that, except uh, 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 I guess they're excluding Christ himself, but Moses was a very meek man. He stood before, before Pharaoh at the risk of life, but God was in charge. He, he stood before Pharaoh ten times and proclaimed, there's going to be a plague sent, Pharaoh, and Pharaoh could have, could have uh, had him arrested. I don't know how that all happened, but he didn't. But Moses spoke the truth to Pharaoh, and he, his own life was at risk, but God was in charge. He left that situation with God himself. Confronted by leader, for leadership position by Korah, if you recall, as they're going through the wilderness, that Korah launched a rebellion against Moses and wanted to take all the people back to Israel. Korah launched this rebellion, and the Bible says that Moses went to God, and, and God dealt with Korah. And the Bible says that the earth opened up and swallowed him up. Moses didn't, didn't try to assemble uh, armed guards, and he didn't try to assemble an army out of, the, out of the people of Israel to go fight against Korah. Surely he had the authority and the ability to do such a thing, but he didn't. He takes it to God, and God dealt with the, with the rebellion. And again, and again, when his own brother and sister rebelled against him and said, Moses, we can hear from God just like you can. And God was angered at, at Aaron and Miriam. Moses, again, didn't try to take charge of the situation. He didn't try to... to uh, uh, stop the rebellion, but God himself uh, intervened, and Miriam was struck, stricken with leprosy for a little while, until Moses, what did he do? He prayed for her, God, don't hold this against her, heal her, take away this leprosy. Moses did not take matters into his own hands, but he trusted God. Meekness, 
a meek man, a man who trusted and followed the commands of God. Now, Christ demonstrated meekness in the wilderness as he was tempted by Satan. You say, how did he do that? If you remember, Satan tempted him. He had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And, the, and Satan said, Jesus, take these rocks and turn them into bread. Did Jesus have the ability and the authority to do such a thing, to perform such a miracle? Absolutely he did. Absolutely, he could have taken charge and said, you're right, I'm going to do that. But in, rather, than, rather than take charge himself, he commits himself to God, and, to God the Father. He says, I always do the will of my Father. Let me just pause on that point a second. He always does the will of his Father. That is not just speaking about his walk here on earth. Jesus, who is eternally preeminent, preeminent to the incarnation, always existed, and even in eternity past, he always did the will of the Father. As he is born and incarnated here on earth, he always does the will of the Father. As he ascends into heaven, on the day of, on the, uh, before the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1, as he ascends into heaven, He's seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And, and the Father exalts him and puts him at his right hand. He always does the will of the Father. He demonstrated meekness all the way, his whole life, and to the end. Meekness is not just an attitude towards people, though. Meekness is an attitude we develop in every aspect of our life. In every aspect of our life, do we try to take charge and control of our finances? Boy, we sure do. When we don't get that raise that we were expecting at, 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 at work, boy, we're going to take charge or we're going we're to go talk to somebody. You know, if, and, uh, or if we have a health problem and the doctor missed something, we want to know what happened. We're going to take charge or we're going to go do something. That's, that's kind of the natural reaction that we have. Rather than committing, we can commit things to, to the Father and say, God, this belongs to you. This situation is yours. I could take charge. I could take action. But God, I'm waiting on you. Be still. The scripture says, be still and know that I am God. There's a time to be still. There is a time for action as well. We need to have a meek spirit when it comes to trusting God for everything. In every aspect of our life, it is not just an attitude that we have towards people, but meekness is an attitude that we have uh, towards God himself. God, you are in charge. And the question is, can we trust him for everything? Or do we have to be in charge? Can we trust him? We can. We can trust him. Yesterday, uh, uh, as I was studying yesterday morning, uh, trying to get ready for today and, you know, how you can be kind of anxious about things. And, and uh, I was, you know, trying to get things together. And I know, Pastor, I'm sure that you've had this happen probably many times, but this is probably a first for me. And that is uh, your day gets interrupted. Just an interruption, just, just all of a sudden pops in and something's, something, something's happened, something's going wrong. Well, yesterday I was studying some and, and going over things, and then about 11.30, and, and then Ellen and I were going to go into town and go run some errands, go do a few things. And, so, and then I was going to come back, and I was going to uh, study uh, further, you know, and, and try to just uh, calm down, you know, and just, just be ready and prepared and, and uh, thoughtful, and, and so that's, that was my plan for the day, but God had a whole different plan for me. About, about uh, 11.45, I got a call. Uh, all of you know that my mother, uh, Yvonne Mormon, is living at uh, uh, an assisted living center here in, in the Conroe area, 
And they called me yesterday morning and they said, uh, your mother's had an accident. They said, uh, they kind of explained what had happened, that she was in her, her geriatric chair and she had some sort of uh, reflex or something and her, her leg went up and hit a sharp corner on a table. When it hit the table, it broke her skin and, and uh, 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 gouge, and it was, uh, by the way they were looking at it, they said, well, we think it's going to take some medical attention. So, uh, you know, so all of a sudden, um, you know, my day is, is uh, going to be focused here real quick. It's going to be focused on getting mom taken care of. And as we're, uh, as we're driving over there, I told Ellen, I said, Ellen, I said, I'm really anxious. I said, I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow morning. And I said, and when we get to the, when, and I've got so many things to do. And when we get to, uh, to do this, you know, it may take. You know, it may take all day long to, to go through the emergency room and to get this all taken care of. And, and uh, um, she said, that's okay. She just real calmly said, just take, take it one step at a time. One step at a time. And so uh, we got there and uh, we walked in and uh, we walked into the, uh, to the facility and Ellen comes in just completely in charge you know it's good to have a, a, a nurse an RN for a wife she knew what to do she just walked in and took charge and uh, asked the right questions and dressed the wound and and um, made calls when calls needed to be made and just uh, everything kind of fell into place and we got her into the ER room and she got 10 stitches in her leg and uh, gave her antibiotics and we got her back you know about Four, about four, four thirty yesterday afternoon, and and uh, and you, but you know what? I think God was taking me to school. I think He was taking me to school. I was anxious about everything. How are we going to get all this done? I mean, this could go. I've been up there. I've been up to the ER room till midnight before with with uh, dealing with medical issues. So, Lord, what what's going to happen here? And Ellen helped me and just. Uh, helped me step right through it and everything got taken care of. Mom's doing great, doing well, and on her antibiotics. And so, uh, but, you know, that's our first reaction is we're going to take charge and we're going to try to do what we need to get done. And rather than trusting God, God can take care of things. And I said on the way over there, I said, Ellen, I said, God knows that I'm speaking tomorrow morning and he knows I got some things I need to to go over, but he knows about mom too. And he knows, he knew that this was all gonna happen. I said, I guess I'm gonna have to trust him. And she just, yeah, just calmly helped step me through it. We got through it and, and everything's fine. She just re reassured me that God is in control and he knows about everything. So, um, so here I am speaking on meekness this morning, taking Taking yourself out of the driver's seat and acknowledging that, acknowledging that God is in control, trusting him to work out all the details. So he said, let's get a little practice before you talk about meekness. <laughs> so that's what he did. He says, are you ready to trust me? Well, okay, God, I'll, I'll try to respond better next time. <laughs> Finally, we see that meekness is seen in the life of Christ himself. Uh, you may have thought that was rather strange uh, portion of scripture that uh, Jamie read this morning from John chapter 2, where he, it says that he cast out the money changers. Um, so how, do, how does that fit in with meekness? How does, uh, how does Christ drive out the money changers, and how does he... Uh, you know, drive out all the animals and overturn the tables and do all this, and he's still the meek and lowly Jesus. Yeah, he is. See, Jesus took action in defense of the Father. In defense of the holiness of God, Jesus took action. When it came to himself, he, he, he bore under the duress. 
he bore under the shame of being of, of, of the crucifixion. He, he didn't revile back again. In fact, he even said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So Jesus, in one sense, defends the Father. And he was attacked many times. If you read through the Gospels, he was attacked many times by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But what was he doing? He was attacked by them because he was... Uh, he was helping others. He was healing. He was healing on the Sabbath day. He, wrote, he, he was raising people from the dead. But yet he was being attacked on all sides for the good that he's performing. The Bible doesn't say that he, that he took any action against those that were accusing him. But he was going to stand up for his father and for his father's house. He was jealous over that. What does that mean for us? I'm going to let you kind of chew on that this week. Think about it. How does that relate to me? At what times am I going to be gentle and not, and not uh, try to pay back? And at what times do I need to speak up? And at what times do I need to do something? Because when there was a time and necessary, Jesus did. But he never, he never uh, did this out of a burst of anger. If you also look at that text of scripture in John chapter 2, the Bible says that when he saw the money changers and what was going on in the temple area, he sat down and he made a whip of cords. So it wasn't just an outburst like you may have seen in some movies. It wasn't an outburst, but it was a methodical uh, thing that he was going to do. He sat down, made the whip of cords, and drove them out and overturned the tables. We need to be a, a, a people of meekness because the scripture says that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not timid, but ab able to put your faith and trust and confidence fully in God himself that he's going to work all things out to the end and that he is going to uh, take care of the situations and more than, and, and you will find that he does, that, it's, that it, he is going to work all things out and he works them all out for our good. Are we, are we willing and are we able to put our faith and trust in him? Are we going to be gentle and meek and lowly as Christ was? Or do we want to take charge? Something to ponder, folks. I tell you, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, they're deep. You'll find yourself over your head very quickly. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we uh, prepare to close in song. I'd like to just say a closing prayer. Father, we're just so thankful to you for your word, for the promises that we have, Lord, for the light that it provides. Lord, we've all been in the situation where we were walking in darkness. And it was a deep darkness. We were in control of Satan himself, our father. But Lord, we saw a light. The light of the gospel that came to us. We are so thankful to you, Lord Jesus. Now I pray your blessings upon us this morning. As we ponder this week. and As we dwell upon your word, Lord. May we be a people of the kingdom. May we be meek and gentle with others around us. Help us, we pray, Lord Jesus. For it is not in and of ourselves, but it is a gift of God. You're working in our hearts. You're working in our lives. And for that, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand as we close in prayer. A close in song, I'm sorry. And stand, and uh, if you have anything that you need prayer requests for, 
uh, the other elders are available and come on to the front and we will uh, pray with you. So let's sing. Thank you.